the Gambia, the smiling coast of Africa. Let's get interactive on social media. Say your views and opinions with us on Facebook at PTV Gambia, Instagram at PTV Gambia, Twitter at PTV Gambia, and YouTube at PTV Gambia. You can download our app on Google Play Store and App Store. PTV Reflecting Gambia. Wherever you go, we'll be there. Together with you, we taking you higher. We got the power to make you a champion. Can you imagine us celebrating love? What we can do, we make your dreams come true. We put you first in our representation. We're not for just one, but for the whole. What keeps us connected? Is it the memories we share? Is it the pictures we take every single morning? Is it the bond that binds us? Is it the time we spend together? Is it sharing the same dream or the same life? The secret is, This deep connection between us? Keep it real. Stay connected. With Afrizel, you're never out of credit even if you're out of cash. Borrow up to $250 as credit with the Afrizel Cola Credit. Send a blank SMS to 152 to activate the Cola Credit. Afrizel Cola Credit, the solution for you. Send money to Gambia for free. You can now send money via MoneyGram to AfriMoney in Gambia anytime, anywhere. Simply go on to MoneyGram.com or the app and select Pay through AfriMoney to send. Make sure the receiver is registered on AfriMoney in Gambia or get them to dial star 777 hash to register. Instantly, the money comes into their AfriMoney wallet. <laughs> Welcome to the third edition of Bohaba Red Carpet here at El Sol Restaurant in Senegambia. Today we're going to be discussing about land governance challenges and impact. And uh, we have a guest lecturer who will lecture for 15 minutes as usual to be followed by 45 minutes questions and answers. And we're uh, well aware that the topic of discussion cannot be exhausted within one hour. But however, we will endeavor to do our best within the next 60 minutes to give you as much value as is possible. Prior to private practice, Metz Bensuda worked for the Gambia government for 14 years and was Solicitor General of the Gambia for five years, from 1990 to 1995, and also acted as Minister of Justice and Attorney General. She was respectively legal drafts person Chief Parliamentary Counsel and Counsel for the Privatization of State-Owned Enterprises and Reform of Parastatals. As Counsel for Government, Diverse Teacher and Public Enterprise Reform Program, Ms. Bensuda reconstructed 
restructured several corporations and parastatals for privatization. She set up joint ventures between government, both local and international private investors. As law officer, then Solicitor General, Ms. Bensuda has also negotiated loans with international institutions like the International Finance Corporation, World Bank, Arab Bank for Economic Development in Africa, Badir, African Development Bank, and Islamic Development Bank, and negotiated debt relief on behalf of the government with the Paris Club. Ms. Bensuda founded her law firm, Ami Bensuda and Co. LP, in 1995. Ms. Bensuda's professional, professional areas of expertise include corporate and commercial law, banking and finance, property, public policy and regulation, intellectual property, human rights, dispute resolution. She advises Gambian and international financial and corporate institutions, including government agencies and parastatals on regulatory matters and reform international transactions, and financial arrangements. Ms. Bensuda is a member of the London Institute of Chartered Arbitrators and a trained mediator. She has been involved in numerous high-profile litigation matters and has acted as an arbitrator and mediator in commercial disputes. She sits on the board of several financial companies and NGOs and has served as president of the Gambia Bar Association for two consecutive terms. Ms. Bensuda is particularly interested in land reform and is a member of TAFLAG, Africa Land Advisory Group. Ms. Bensuda served as counsel to the Commission of Enquiry into the financial activities of public bodies, enterprises, and offices as regards their dealings with former President Yahya Jame and connected matters. Ms. Bensuda has worked as consultant to the World Bank, UNDP, and the uh, European community. She is a lecturer of legal conveyancing and drafting at the Gambia Law School. My, lex my guest lecturer today, ladies and gentlemen, is Ms. Ami Bensuda. And the topic is land governance challenges and impact. Ms. Bensuda, please. It's a bit difficult introducing a lawyer. <laughs> I wanted to get every word right. <laughs> please, first 15 minutes. You did. Thank you for inviting me. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The time allotted is extremely limited, so I am going to be focusing on only one aspect of land governance, which I think is a threshold issue and from which perhaps the conversation can be expanded. The centrality of land to our existence is self-evident. Our survival is tied to the land for food, shelter, clothing, and the tools that have defined human development. Our five over 5,000 years of recorded history tells us that how much fertile land, water-rich land, or mineral-rich land the human species is able to access and control has been the determinant factor in how we have settled the earth, whether peaceably or by, by force, until almost all borders have been fixed more or less in the last 200 years. It is now no longer open to us to park our belongings in search of better pastures when we are overgrazed. Therefore, how we manage the space that by default or otherwise we are tied to defines the quality of our lives. In recent times, pressure from growing populations, the rapid degrading of the earth, and its environment, and climate change with the noted implications of food security, shelter, fertile soil, clean water, and air, pose enormous challenges. The management of land resources has become a major issue globally. In our region, this is articulated in various international instruments. In the Gambia, we know the problem is acute. We have a land mass of about 10,000 square kilometers, 10,690 to be precise, of which about half is arable, on which we are able to grow food for our consumption. A population of about 2 million people, 
almost 187 people per square kilometer, one of the highest population densities in the world. All social indicators tell us that we are a fragile country with a fragile economy and ecosystem and limited capacity to withstand shocks. We do not require indicators to see that we cannot feed ourselves or clothe ourselves. And apart from sand, we do not produce any of the essential input required for our shelter. In short, the country does not have any mineral resources to speak of, services or other productivity that can generate a budget surplus to, to unexpected revenues, which can be deployed to development. Clearly, we require a smart, dynamic, and more plausible blueprint to take us out of what has become a vicious cycle of poverty and underdevelopment. Such a blueprint must, as a necessity, include a robust governance fr framework for the management of land resources, as it is now well recognized that there cannot be good governance without sound, sound land governance. What does a sound land governance environment look like? A sound governance framework is now generally recognized by the following hallmarks. A legal system and institutional structure that recognizes and enforces existing rights. A fit for purpose land use plan with effect, developed with effective public participation and supported by planning and the management regulations justified on the basis of the public interest. A transparent land related taxation system. Accountable management of public lands. A land information system which provides relevant information to the public. Integrated land administration services that work. A land dispute resolution system that keeps land disputes low. In 2013, I had the privilege of leading and coordinating the work of a team of Gambian experts to carry out an assessment of the state of land governance in the Gambia using a World Bank diagnostic tool called ELGAF. It was an insightful experience for me. The, the outcome of the assessment showed that the situation required extensive and urgent intervention. The ELGAF was conducted with the sanction of the government and full participation of senior officers. We had expected that its outcome will bring change. Unfortunately, little has changed outwardly since the report. If anything, the situation has become even more di dire. The protection of land rights is part of fundamental human rights provided for by the Constitution and by international law. A land governance system must of necessity and by law be premised on existing land rights, which in turn flow from the land tenure system. So in order to appreciate my paper, you would have to have some understanding of the land tenure system. And I'm, I'm glad that I see some law school students, as well as university students. As you know, the Gambian land tenure system is based on three tenure types, the freehold, leasehold, and customary tenure. The first two are based on English law, while customary law, as the no name connotes, develops from the traditional practices of our peoples. Two acts are relevant. There will be a third one, which I'll discuss later. The State Lands Act. Which, the, which is the successor of the Land Banjul and Combo St. Mary Act, and the Land Provinces Act. The, state land, this, the, the former act, which is the Straight Land Act, proceeds from the premise that title in the colonial territories vested in the state and defines state land as, as all land acquired by the colonial government and passed on to the state. On the other hand, the Land Provinces Act covers the provinces which were under un indirect rule by the colonial government. The Land Provinces Act recognizes the primacy of the rights of indigenous, indigenous peoples to the land and vests all land in the provinces in the district authorities for the benefit of the people. 
1970, the government leased from the Combo North and Combo South District Authorities the coastal strip, an area of 800 meters from the high water mark. This is known as the tourism development area. This has had far-reaching consequences on customary li la um, rights of, to land in the regions. Also in 1991, a major innovation was introduced by the State Lands Act by the creation of the Dean Lease. The act conferred on the Minister of Local Government the power to designate any land in the regions as uh, uh, state land. And upon such designation, all land in the area is, is regarded, uh, occupiers of all land in the area become lessees of the state, deemed lessees of the state for a period of 99 years. I'll come back to these laws later and how they have impacted um, customary land rights in particular. In 1945, the Lands Provinces Act actually guaranteed security of tenure. And I talk about the challenges because I think I have quite a, sh a short time left. Um, however, the broad-based recognition has proven to be woefully inadequate in safeguarding land rights over time. Customary law applica applicable to land remains unwritten and therefore uncertain. Regulations were never made for the implementation of the provisions of the Act. All processes under the Act have been entirely administrative. Without mapping and titling of rights to land, the traditional demarcation of land between communities and families continues to be physical landmarks, including trees, shrubs, and physical features, many of which have disappeared. The fact that customary law is unwritten places on due and often misplaced reliance on local elders and traditional leaders. And with their passing, the situation has become even more flawed and fluid. In more recent years, land formerly owned by Kabilos have been fragmented into household ownership in most communities. Although some communities still maintain the old system of Kabilo ownership, this is on the decline. While household ownership may in some cases be regarded as an improvement over Kabilo ownership for management purposes, there is little if any legal protection for vulnerable groups like women and children when land is demarcated. The impact of the State Lands Act have been detrimental to customary land rights in the regions. There was never any attempt to reconcile customary rights with the deemed leasehold title and its implication for owners under customary law who hitherto believed they enjoyed rights akin to a freehold title. There is also a conflict of perception on, on the effect of the State Lands Act on pre-existing rights. The state, it seems, believed that by the designation of um, any area to be state land, the rights in the land, the freehold title to the land vested in the state. A close review of the provisions of the act, however, indicates that this was not the intention. And the state merely becomes a trustee replacing the district authority. Unfortunately, it would appear that once deemed leasehold land is conveyed to an, converted to an actual lease from the state, all benefits over the land, including land rent, in all solely to the benefit of the state and not the communities. The Gambia Tourism Board Act also compounded the situation. As we know, the Gambia T Tourism, Develop the T Tourism Board Act is about the TDA. We are in the TDA, I presume. However, the original TDA-1 was a leasehold from the district authorities of Combo North and Combo South to the government to enable the government create the an area for tourism investment. However, the lease seems to have been misplaced or lost, and the terms of the lease unknown. So the, the Gambia Tourism Board Act reverses the tourism areas in the tourism board as a lease directly from the state without recognizing 
the pre-existing rights of the customary landowners. The failure to rec recognize the la legal rights of the original landowners of the coastal strip and to ensure that they benefited from its ex exploitation has been a source of tension manif um, manifest between not only TDA rights granted, but sand mining rights granted under the Mining Act. There are numerous challenges, but I'll highlight two, one or two before my time ends. There is no individual title for customary land. The best one can hope for is an Alcalo certificate and an entry in the register of yard owners at the level of the municipality. Recording for its purposes is not registration and does not protect the rights of landowners. The leasing process for customary land is not specified in any regulations. Consequently, the process is cumbersome and, and opaque. It takes years to lease property. Land policy. An articulated land policy does not exist. What policy can be designed from the existing acts, including the Physical Planning and Development Control Act and policy instruments emanating from them are outdated, including the Greater Banjul Area National Master Plan, called the GBA, the Growth Center Master Plans, which were which cover only the most densely population urban areas as of 1985. All these plans expired in 2000 and have not been replaced. Good land governance requires that there exists a comprehensive doctrine or statement that can provide the main justification and orientation for land policy and the formulation of laws as the legal basis for processes and procedures and institutional arrangements. At a minimum, there should be a policy statement in the Constitution that serves as a platform and point of reference for the development of sector policies on land. The 1989 to 1991 land, land policies implemented by the land legislation introduced in 1991 appear to be the last land policies. The concentration of authority over land and its administration in the Ministry of Lands and consequently in the Minister of Lands as an approach to land administration is outdated. None of the land acts include any accountability provisions to curb abuse. There is no record of public participation in the processes relating to the enactment or amendment of land re related laws. Most people are therefore unaware of the contents of these laws and policies. This is a major policy failure. Two minutes, ma'am. All the powers of the Ministry of Lands as the lessor of state land are exercised through the Department of Lands and Surveys, including advising the Ministry on policy formulation, public land management, land information management, allocation and grant of public land, land acquisition and compensation, and land dispute resolution, all in one ministry. This concentration of roles in the Department of Lands has given rise to abuse identified by various commissions of inquiries on land over the years. It has also vested in the executive almost unlimited and unchecked power over the management of public lands. In conclusion, I recommend, and rec in conclusion and my only recommendation, the Gambia National Development Plan 2018 and 2021, which came into effect after the last government, recognizes the need for a national land policy, a national land use master plan, and new land management laws. There is a need to move beyond the rhetoric to action. As a country, we must start a conversation around land rights and land equity and ensure that corrective measure is initiated. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, you may come with the fire. Okay. Thank and you. Because they'll move the podium. Yeah. Please be seated.
Thank you. Uh, I think my producers like you. It's been 20 minutes, uh, even though they told oh. me it will be 15 minutes. But I saw her after 16 minutes with the five minutes, so I thought <laughs> that was okay. good. All right. But uh, let me fire the first question. I'm sure a lot of uh, students here from University of the Gambia Law School and some lawyers here uh, would be interested in uh, also asking questions. But may I begin uh, to ask, since most of the policies, structures around land governance in the Gambia are outdated, what would your recommendation be beyond uh, the NDP 2018-21 uh, policy? What do you think needs to be done? Um, fundamentally, we have to have a blueprint which, uh, which guides whatever needs to be done. And the starting point is land policy. The land policy um, under the colonial government was clear because we knew what the colonial um, government philosophy was, indirect rule, and therefore the rights of the indigenous people in the provinces were safeguarded. Mm -hmm. What is our own philosophy in relation to land? There are fundamental provisions which obviously have to be upheld. And I have referred to them as international, internationally protected land rights, as well as, as well as constitutionally protected land rights. So we must have a policy that reinforces those rights and also, but more importantly, outlines what our approach is going to be in terms of managing our land resources, given the size of the country, given the, the, the size of the economy, given our poverty status, if I may call it that, sorry to say, and the pressure on the land. So it's not ab only about rights, it's about how those rights need to be managed, interfered, one against the other. This, this has to be balanced. So there must be a policy that we discuss as a people and which we can push the government to articulate, hopefully, and the National Assembly to approve. Ideally, it should be in the Constitution. Would you propose, um, say, another ministry to decongest what is already in existence, or would you recommend several departments that would oversee all of this reorganization and restructuring of land governance? I wouldn't recommend that we expand central government in order to deal with land. Um, land is just beyond the mandate of a government. Land is about the people and the people's rights. Whatever policy is determined has to be in what is in the best interest of the people. Of everybody. Everybody. So the move has been towards creating agencies, agencies that are accountable to the National Assembly, agencies that are accountable to the people, and agencies that don't necessarily have to be part of central government. Agencies that are made up of experts who, and who will be responsible for steering us or for implementing whatever in, uh, um, uh, land policy we put in place and whatever law we put, is put in place. Because it's a policy and then the law that designs the institutional framework. But that institutional framework, in my view has to be a framework that is a mixture of public and private, if I may call it public, um, civil, civil and public, public meaning the government and civil society and private interests. So we can no longer leave land management just to government. So I do not recommend the expansion of central government by the creation of ministries to deal with land. But uh, last question, I, I, I promise for me for now, we'll come to the audience. But also one of the challenges we have, particularly in the combos, is how individual Kabilos and the traditional land tenure system, i.e. Alcalo, Chiefs, etc., have also pretty much disposed of all land that uh, were to be bequeathed to our young people and the next generation of Gambians. Uh, do you think uh, such a civil, public, 
entity coming together may be able to protect such powers from within the Kabilos themselves? Um, again, we go back to policy. It should not be possible, whatever your rights, to be able to dispose of them at will. There must be fundamental guidelines as to how those land rights can be dealt with. And that's the purpose of good public manage land management and land use planning. As I have mentioned, we, do, we haven't had a land use plan since 2000. That's how many years? 23. 20, 23 years. Yeah. How has the population grown since 2000? Let's look at the demography. Look at the Greater Banjul area, the region, the, the, the Kabilos. Just outside um, Seregambia here, mm -hmm. you have the beginning of Combo North. Yeah. Combo North is, is classified as, as rural region, uh, um, rural land. It's still yeah. rural land. Is it rural? No, it is urban. We can see it. But where are the instruments dealing with the situation that has arisen as a result of the lack of land policy? as a result of the lack of up-to-date land use plans and as a result of a law that really addresses the issue of land rights in a meaningful way. No, a Kabilo, a Kabilo elder should not be able to dispose of land at will without taking into consideration all the rights that subsist in that land. And by rights, I mean not only la rights of the Kabilo members, but rights of people who don't own the land, the right of usage of other people, the right of government to plan, to plan the land resources of this country. Um, when it comes to physical planning, it's about needs. What are our needs as far as the land is concerned? We need food. Look at Combo North and Combo South. There is bar barely any agricultural land left. But where is the law, where is the policy that should guide the use of land in Combo North or Combo South? There is none. So willy-nilly, I don't blame the Kabilos. They do not have other resources. What they have is the land resources in the absence of any policy, in the absence of any law or guidelines, in the absence of a plan that will enable the Kabilos exploit their land in a responsible way, all they can do is follow the herd. Everything is demand-driven. You are starving and someone wants to buy your land, so you sell it. You don't see the use of the land because you don't have the inputs to grow food. You have not been able to commercialize your land. You have not been able to put it to a use that would enable you as a person to survive. To survive. So this is the resource you have. But then that is bad for the country. We need to grow food. If you look at the Greater Banyul Master Plan that was in effect from 1985 to 2000, it actually had criterion as to what land can be developed for residential purposes and at what land must remain agricultural. Only infertile land was recommended for residential purposes. But look at what is happening. All the furrows are being settled. There is no zoning. All this because one, there is an absence of up-to-date policy. Two, there are no guidelines. There is no physical planning that covers the country. I understand they are working on a master plan now, but it is still an update of the existing mas master plan, but this time extended only to Brikama as the Greater Banjul Master Plan. What about the rest of the country? What about the rest of the country? We will uh, take some questions now from the audience. Uh, please tell us who you are, where you're from, and stick to one question at a time. Uh, anybody? If not, I have several I can fire. Please go ahead. Tell us who you are and fire up. My name is Osei Fuku. Uh, I'm a student from the Ghana, uh, Gambia Law School, and a Ghanaian. Ms. Bensuda, in your speech, you made mention of diversifying land management by the inclusion of uh, civil society organizations and also uh, private players. But I want to know with your experience in land management, I want to know how feasible would it be in a country where the government has 
over the years been managing lands. How feasible would they uh, accept new players into land management systems in Gambia? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's an interesting question. Um, I don't know whether they will accept or not accept um, the restructuring of the man land management system. But there is sufficient, I think there are sufficient studies actually, including the LGAP, the one that I've done, that have made recommendations concerning land management. Of course, we have to have an institutional framework for land management. But um, there is a rights in land subsists at different levels. There is public land, which must be redefined, because as we speak now, public land seems to be all land that is under the control of the minister through leasing. But the private land rights are much wider than public land rights. And as I said, land is not the prerogative of government. Government is expected to put in place institutional frameworks emanating from what the laws and the constitution recommends. So it's not what government will accept, but what the people of the Gambian need that is important. Um, unfortunately, we had a draft constitution which did actually make statements as to what policies ought to guide um, land, land issues in the Gambia. The constitution, as we all know, really has fallen by the wayside for the time being. But there is nothing stopping us from pushing for an amendment to the existing constitution so that the parameters of land policy and its management can be debated upon and set out. Government's duty is to implement whatever has been determined in this respect. Uh, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, another question, please? Stand up so we can see you. Hi, my name is Natasha Bino. Thank you so much for this enlightening conversation. I'm from Barbados. I'm also a PhD student at the University of Western Ontario. So, uh, as many scholars like myself tell, back home, home to Africa, Africa to learn about, about, our about, our about, our about, about our heritage and our culture, African tourism is definitely on the rise. I know you mentioned it before, but my question is what has the government planned or have implemented or strategized? in regards to heritage tourism in their How? How has the government planned strategized um, in terms of heritage tourism? Heritage. So as we find more spaces that might be related to the transatlantic slave trade or uh, various um, entities or ideas, how does the government plan to conserve those land areas? If you understand what I mean. Let, let me say this is not a government official. <laughs> Let's begin from there. <laughs> All right. Um, I am not aware, actually, that um, the land policies in the past have taken into account heritage in such a broad, broad perspective. Um, however, the Land Provinces Act actually uh, pr uh, proceeds from the premise that land belongs to the people, belongs to the community. And therefore, this means that our heritage in terms of land is being preserved. Our rights as, as um, they have evolved from the past was being preserved. It was up to us, the governments that have followed, since followed, to articulate what this meant. And I think in doing so, it's, it's not late, in doing so, one can articulate it in a way that covers concerns and that covers current, the current um, policy, if I may say so, of encouraging the return of our lost brothers and sisters from across the ocean. I think there's space. But as of now, um, I have not um, come across it in the debate that's taking place. But um, now that all of you are here, I think you can add your voices to that debate. Add voices to the debate so the conversations will be widened and we will see how all of us could harmoniously live together in this smiling coast called the Gambia. Go ahead, sir. 
Good afternoon. My name is Tony F. Mendy. Uh, senior Council, I have a question regarding the uh, regarding the dual approach to right, rights in the Gambia. In the LGAF, you did spoke of the rights in the Gambia. I want to speak more on the effect of the state decline in a particular. Let's <laughs> The other one was better, actually. <laughs> I okay. don't know what happened. Again, you, in the LGAF, you spoke of the dual approach to land rights in the Gambia. I want you to speak on the effect of the state declaring the customary uh, land to be a deemed um, lease land, and how does that affect the land of the people who are currently uh, under the customary land system? I think that's a good question. Um, this is how it works. The 1991 State Lands Act was an act that, um, if you look at the long title, was designed to encourage landowners to commercialize their land. And since the leasehold title is the most secure title as we know it in the Gambia, uh, the act provided a process, a procedure, whereby landowners could convert their land to a leasehold title. However, what the Act does not reconcile is the rights of a landowner whose rights are more or less an absolute title. It's like a freehold title under English law. Because we don't really, apart from if you own land in the provinces and you are the landowner, unless it's land that belongs to a cabilo, but if the land is individualized, it is yours. And it is, if you look at the, um, the, the incidence of such a right, it's a right that really is more far-reaching. I think it's more comprehensive than um, the leasehold. So if you convert your land to a leasehold, what happens? is that you are then leasing it from the minister, because it's the minister who will grant you a lease, as opposed to a customary land in an area that is not designated. When, for instance, you are in the North Bank, because the North Bank doesn't have designated state land, if you lease your land, it is the district authority that will grant you a lease with the approval of the minister. So there's a difference. But where land is designated state land, it is the minister that will grant you a lease. Now, the, the conflict, as I see it, is this. That once the minister grants you a lease over that land, what happens is that the minister then exercises all the rights of the lessor, your law student, of the owner of the land over the land, over, over, over that piece of land. So it means now the minister sets conditions for your ownership. It means you can, he can re-enter the land. If you convert the land to another use, he can apply the forfeiture clauses under the law on that land. Whereas really, originally, before you lease the land, you had absolute title. By converting your land to a leasehold, you have a lesser title. So these rights have not been reconciled. And, and also that is where the abuse comes in. Because once you convert your land, land to a leasehold and you lease it from the minister, and for instance, for example, you want to then say it's farmland, it's agricultural lease, and you want to convert it to a residential lease because you want to maybe demarcate it and sell parts of it, the minister will ask you to forfeit part of that land. And when you forfeit part of that land, it reverts to the minister, as we speak now, as part of public land, government land. And the minister can dispose of the land as he wishes. So the whole structure of the, land, the State Lands Act, for me, is problematic. And I think it raises jurisprudential questions that have never been um, resolved. So in terms of land governance, what does it mean, this mean? It means instead of introducing a law that actually protects rights. We have, by the State Lands Act, introduced a law 
that's actually diminishing rights in land. Is that constitutional, I ask you? Isn't that a way also of depriving the, the, the people of their rights, landowners of their rights in designated areas? And this is some of the conversations I think we must have if we are to take corrective measure, measures. And the implications also extend to land speculation, for instance. Cabilos give you land for agricultural purposes, for instance, for next to nothing. You turn around and lease the land from the state. The Cabilos are not your landlords. If they have the absolute title in the land, then they should be your landlords, right? And any rent to be paid should be paid to the Cabilos. But instead, when you lease your land, the rent is paid to the state. When you want to dispose of the land, all the taxes go to the state. So basically, nothing goes back to the Cabilos. So the State Lands Act, in my view, is a systematic deprivation of the rights of landowners of their land, lands in the areas in which the state land apply. That might be seen as an extreme view, but it's a view I hold firmly to. Extend it to the TDA, for instance. The first TDA, as I said, was a lease. It's a 1970 lease between the Combo North District Authority, the Combo South District Authority, and the state. And it created this strip of, strip of line, 800 meters wide, from Klo Kololi Point. Where is Kololi? Kololi Point is yeah, just Kololi, yeah. behind us. Mm -hmm. Up to Katom, the whole coastline was leased to the state. They cannot find the lease. Nobody seems to be able to find the lease. What is expected, it is said to be for 99 years. 1970 to, to now is how much? How many years? About 40 years. So we have another F 60 years. 50 years. Yeah. We have another 50 years to go. But that is not the problem. The problem is, if the district authorities are the leasers of that land, then what the state owns is a leasehold. And what it can give to anyone, to the, TD, to the Tourism Development Board, is a sublease. However, nothing in this arrangement allows the Combo North District Authority or the Combo South District Authority to benefit. So if you are granted a sublease of land in the tourism development area, you are, it, it is granted to you at a premium, and a significant premium. But none of that premium finds its way back to the communities. If any of these, any of these activities in the TDA that are paying taxes, rates, that are all paying, none of it finds its way back to the communities. So then what is the policy behind the TD? So all these mechanisms that have been put in place supposedly for investment only contribute to impoverishing landowners in the region. And I think we must rethink the policy. We must rethink the policy. Mr. Mendy, uh, the question was thrown back at you. Did you get it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, I'll answer for you. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, we have, uh, I think, about 15. 15 more minutes, give and take. Well, the time has gone quite really fast. Yes, it has. It, it, it really yes. flies fast. I Ami, we, we cannot hear you, Ami. Ami. Hello. Yes. My question uh, specifically is, considering the absence of land policy, what extent of damage could the absence of land And can you please explain Sorry. to me? In the absence of a land, land policy, policy, yes. Considering the absence of land policy, to what extent of damage could the absence affect the resolution of land matters in the Gambia? Because we have realized within our localities, um, issues of land matters are really growing wild. So to what do you think um, the presence of land policy could solve the matter? And please explain to me what uh, you mean by uh, there's no individual title to customary land. Thank you. Thank you, Ami. Um, land policy is to land as the Constitution is to the people. Um, land policy is the fundamental basis for the land acts. Of course, we already have a, a constitutional rights regime which protects 
a landowner from the wrongful deprivation of property. Um, we also have international law, um, which also um, protects, upholds the national protection of, of, of land rights. But each country is different. Each country's needs are different. And therefore, we must, based on our needs and our, our limited land resources, and uh, our need to manage those resources properly, we must have a defined land policy. These are statements that will guide not only the state, but the National Assembly, for instance, in the, in the, in the, um, in the development of the appropriate laws. So land policy and land law is what really would form the basis of good governance. And it's the land policy which determines or which gives a broad, broad philosophical approach to what you would put in your land law. But it's the land law that creates the institutional framework and uh, the rules by which all of us should pl play, if I may use that word, the rules which would apply to each of us. You own land which is agricultural. I own land which is residential. Um, I need to farm the land. Or I own land on which is sand mining land. Which do we give priority to? Or the same land, which do we give prior priority to? Is it the sand mining? Is it the agriculture? Is it the um, residence on, a, on the same piece of land? This is, can only be determined by law, not by your right or my right, because we are neighbors. We can fight, but that is not, that is not, that is not, that is not good, right? So we need to have a law that, between ourselves, determines how you exploit your rights in a prudent and a beneficial way. I can also explore my right in a prudent and beneficial way. Another example is land rights. You know, I always tell my law students, in the same piece of land, there can be many subsisting rights. I am the original landowner. I have the freehold title, but I'm not interested in developing, de de developing it. I lease it to you. I give you a lease because you're interested in developing it. So you lease it, give me something, and grow your food. You, you decide, okay, I've been growing food on this land, but I can build a shop, you know, and sell it. You build a shop, oh, I don't want to be the one to sell it. You rent out the, sh the shop, and someone comes and also benefits on the same piece of land. So in the same piece of land, you can have layers of rights. How does it work? How actually do we do, do those rights, um, really, in terms of um, dealing with each other? How will it work? So that is where the law comes in. So I'm just giving this example. Some of them might be, you might find, find silly. But I hope it gives you an idea of what is needed. So it's not sufficient to make a pronouncement that all land in, let's say, Brufut belongs to the Bojangkunda Kabilo. Land is not a commodity you can lift and take away. Land is only useful depending on its productivity. Land, but we as a people, need to be able to have a, 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 a land use plan that determines what use every piece of land in the Gambia should be, should be. We must have a land use plan also that um, preserves land for the future, preserves land for forestry, land for biodiversity, land for flora and fauna. You know, uh, we must have laws that prohibit deforestation that determines whether a land should be a forest or farmland. All these, all these are laws that must be put in place. So, um, young lady, policy first, so that we have a philosophical basis for law, then law, which will determine the institutional framework as well as the processes and procedures by which land would be managed. That is what is important. What was the second question? What was the second question? Ah, yes. All right. And that's going back to the fundamental basis approach of customary land law. Customary law vests land in a group. In de depending on the location, it may be a kabilo. Now, a kabilo is a, is a mandinka, mandinka word, but it has an, 
it's original derivation. I'm sure I won't argue with the Sarahule. Maybe it's Sarahule. But, um, it is Mandinka. It's Mandinka. <laughs> we agree. So um, the Kabilo is made up of families. Let's say the Bojangkunda Kabilo. Over time, may have grown into 20 families, 20 different family units. And they all own the land together. So the land is a group, group holding. As of now, we do not have, some countries do, we do not have a way of titling group holdings. And I think we should have. However, when the land is partitioned between families, it still is a group holding, but it's smaller groups. Families can then individualize that land, but it is a process. But what the law does not have is how this should happen and what the rights of family members should be and how, in particular, the rights of vulnerable group people like the, the women who may not have had a seat at the decision-making table can be protected. Because it's a fallacy to say that women don't have rights in land. Women have, at least among the Mandinka, women do have rights over farmland, over, over rice fields. So it's a question of the type of land. Women do have rights. But you will find that when Kabilos actually demarcate the land, sometimes they don't consult the women, and therefore they don't even safeguard women's rights. What are the rules about children? You are a Kabilo, you are a family. You are disposing of the land. How are the rights of future generations um, protected? Are we, as a people, just going to allow the Kabilo to sell the whole land without regard to how the rest of the family is going to survive? Are we going to have laws that restrict the, that Kabilo head from doing that, limiting what he can do and what he cannot do? These are the kind of um, uh, um, you know, legislative initiatives that we must look at. And it's getting very late. Because you will find that in the greater Banjul area, the Combo, North, South, and so, so many people have already disposed of, land, of their land. The Land Provinces Act had extensive provisions about non-indigenous non people. There's, there are restrictions even now as to what type of, or, or what type of land indigenous people can have and the period of time the type of lease and the conditions of it's all there. But it's no longer relevant. It's no longer relevant. Who is, who is a non-indigene? And who is an indigene? I mean, these things are meaningless now. So we cannot have a 19, pre-1965 act determining land rights and our interest in land in 2023. And that is what is happening. I'm going to, yeah. uh, 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 my apologies, I'm going to take my rights now as host to not give any questions uh, because we are now running out of time. But I wanted for the interest of time also in the lack of any organized, structured, systematic land governance systems, what implications do you foresee? What challenges are there that could make life probably difficult for some of us in the next few years? It, it's the most important one is obvious. The most glaring one, n maybe not the most important, the most glaring one is here. How long does it take you to go to Bikama? Uh, with the OIC roads, uh, two hours and change? Look at, the, look at the, how we live. Look at the chaos, the chaotic, this chaotic physical, I mean, situation in which we all are. Without a coherent land use plan, without coherent land use plan, if this chaos extends beyond the Greater Banjul area, there will be no economic activity. I mean, it used to take 20 minutes to get to Bikama. Now you have to plan ahead. How does that impact? Has anybody measured how all this difficulty in moving around impact businesses? Nobody has measured it. I don't think so. I haven't seen it. So that is one of the most important. Look at our beaches. What is the policy regarding sand mining? Our beaches are being taken away for building purposes. I, I think it's the only country in the world that just goes to the beach, takes sand, beach sand, and goes and builds houses. What is the policy? What is the plan 
going ahead for ensuring that we have alternatives. We must have a land use plan. We must plan our country. If all agriculture, if all agricultural land is being converted to residential land, if people are moving away from the land, how are we going to feed ourselves? Are we going to be able to continue to import food? Is it sustainable? It is not. If, if you look at our recent budget, part of the budget, a major part of the budget is projection, is handouts. We actually try to balance our budget by budgeting for handouts, that grants that we are going to get from overseas in order to finance fund our development activities. Is that sustainable? It is not. So there are serious conversations to be had when it comes to land. Because as I said, we need food, we need shelter. If we, we don't have any minerals, but whatever is there, we need to be able to utilize prudently. Look at the incident in Farabar Bantan. How many land conflicts have we had in the past few years? So many land conflicts. Mm. So many, because the land titling system is just not there. By now, the whole country is a small country. Should have been mapped, and all land owners ownership identified. That is what should have been done. Every piece of land should have had an identity and its owner identified. But we are still fighting over boundaries. Is my boundary stops? Oh, my boundary stops at the road which used to be here, at the well which my grandfather dug. What if the well has collapsed? That's where we still are, basics. So to going back to your question, if we do not fix the problems, Gambia is going to be difficult to live in. Not because of anything else, but because land, Gambia, it, it's just going to be difficult. It's just going to be physically difficult to live in. We, 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 we hope the difficulty doesn't come. We hope there is a quick resolution. But by way of closing remarks, we'll give you three minutes uh, so that you could do, in summary, the presentation and, of course, be able to also just link everything plus the questions that have been asked here today. We do know one hour is not enough to do this, but the purpose of Bohaba is to give opportunity to students, research students, lawyers, professionals, to just start a conversation. And we hope this conversation will end up in the classrooms, in university halls, and or research documents of the future. Um, thank, first of all, thank you very much for having me and for allowing me to air my view. Um, uh, land is a big subject, as you have indicated. And I have only touched on mainly two aspects of it, um, which is the recognition of land rights, uh, which really is a uh, is, a, as I said, a threshold issue. And land policy, I have touched on this. But public land management is important. And for many of you who are lawyers, how land in information is managed is also important. How is land information managed in the Gambia? We have two registries. We have the registry at the Ministry of Land, which is a cadastral registry. But what that register, however, that register is limited to leases granted by the state. That is what is registered because it's only leases granted by the state that are mapped, surveyed and mapped, and given an identity by way of a serial registration number. So we have a situation where the only area in the country where land rights are certain is Banjul. Because Banjul, as you know, is, ma is mapped, we have street, street names, street numbers, and these numbers are, uh, correlate with the numbers of the co uh, compounds in the registry. So all land in Banjul has an, a unique identity by that street number. Now, if you leave Banjul, for the rest of us, it's only if you lease your land to the state that your land has an identity. The vast majority of people in this country depend on a piece of paper from the Alcalo or on a red receipt, which is a strip of paper, not even a, 
A4 paper, but a strip of paper showing that they have been paying rates is what represents their rights in the land which they say they own. In many cases, the boundaries are not certain because it's not surveyed or mapped. Um, so we have to move beyond this stage. And my paper, I have limited to, to one subject. I hope I ha will have the opportunity to talk about land information systems in future. Another area, of course, is, as I said, public land management. Um, what is public land? We do not have an inventory of public land. So we are at the mercy of the state as to what is public land. The state allocates land. What is the criteria for deciding that one Gambia will be given land and not another Gambia? Nobody knows because it's not published. All we see that is that every vacant land is being developed. And it's many of them are allocations from the state. But what guides the state in determining who gets land and who doesn't? We do not know. It's a basic requirement of governance that a public land management system must be transparent. And all, restric where all rules, whether restrictions or otherwise, must be for the public benefit. Dispute resolution, land dispute resolution. The courts obviously don't create law. So they have been doing their best to interpret the laws as they find them. However, by now we should have had acts, laws, that actually define the rights of landowners in the Gambia. It should not be left to the courts by looking at old precedents, precedents from the other countries to come to a resolution, or the common law, to come to a, re <coughs> to come to a resolution as to determination of rights. All these must be, excuse me, all these must be codified and in a law. So this, the situation is that nothing, nothing is clear <coughs> in with, re with regard to land rights in the, uh, in the Gambia. <coughs> and you know, there is, a, there is a lot of work being done. There is a lot of work being done in our region, in many countries in our region, in Ghana, in Rwanda, Ru Ru <coughs> Rwanda is a star performer. They have titled the entire country. There is not a single piece of land in Rwanda which is not titled and doesn't have a, a, a title. Kenya has moved very swiftly. Many countries are really addressing their land governance situation. The difficulty I have <coughs> is that there doesn't seem to be any move in the Gambia to address our land governance situation. And I think something needs to be done about it. I think civil society should get involved in the question of land and land management. <coughs> we should just not leave it to the government. Um, one last point that I wish to make. We have an auditing system based in the Constitution over land financial resources. You have the Auditor General that audits the way government manages our finances. Why don't we have an auditing system for the way that the government manages our land resources? As far as I'm concerned, the land resources are even more important. Who audits the government? To whom is the Minister of Lands accountable? These are questions that we must ask. And it is within the responsibility of our National Assembly members to ask the right questions to ensure that the government is accountable for the manner in which it manages our land resources. Apart from the fact that it is our responsibility to put in place a coherent system for the management of land resources. I thank you very much. See, uh, my producer has been like, it's time, it's time, it's time. Yes, we, we, we know it's time and uh, we're very grateful for okay. your accepting our invitation and for coming. And uh, we are well aware this is just the beginning of a conversation. We are hoping in the future, six months, seven months, eight months down the line, we would be able to have you again and we will do a part two 
of the same to probably the producers then would expand the time to an hour and a half or two hours where we can do a more exhaustive discussion and then we will have the students participate with us as well and junior lawyers will participate with us as well. We're very grateful and we want to say thank you for coming and you have really provoked a conversation that needs to continue on dinner tables, in classrooms, in offices, etc. that we may together find a resolution for. Thank you very much for coming thank and you thank for you from us. all of us. Thank and you. some students were interested in the lecture, it will be available, uh, some copies will be with Hadi, so you can wait and we'll do the copies as well. Some of you who want to take pictures, you are welcome to do so. Thank you very much for coming. All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. It has been book. great. Gambia, the smiling coast of Africa. Let's get interactive on social media. Say your views and opinions with us on Facebook at PTV Gambia, Instagram at PTV Gambia, Twitter at PTV Gambia, and YouTube at PTV Gambia. You can download our app on Google Play Store and App Store. PTV Reflecting Gambia. Wherever you go, we'll be there. Together with you, we taking you higher. We got the power to make you a champion. Can you imagine us celebrating love? What we can do, we make your dreams come true. We put you first in our representation. We're not for just one, but for the whole nation. What keeps us connected? Is it the memories we share? Is it the pictures we take every single morning? Is it the bond that binds us? Is it the time we spend together? Is it sharing the same dream or the same life? The secret is This deep connection between us? Keep it real. Stay connected. With Afrizel, you're never out of credit even if you're out of cash. Borrow up to $250 as credit with the Afrizel Cola Credit. Send a blank SMS to 152 to activate the Cola Credit. Afrizel Cola Credit, the solution.